Auburn has reeled off three straight wins as they get ready for a date against New Mexico State in the Iron Bowl next weekend. Will Manis joins the show to talk about the Tigers recruiting, potentially some flips, and what Hugh Freeze has done in year one in the program here on the Crowded Booth. How in here and make yourself feel at home. The Crowded Booth is coming on. The Crowded Booth with Bryce Coon. Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Crowded Booth. Bryce Coon alongside Will Manis. Will, it's been a while since we talked about the Auburn Tigers. It's been and about maybe a month. we just yeah. had to stop talking about them because they went on a three-game win streak. Maybe that was what needed to happen. Yeah, I think it's we had to stop talking about them, and they had to uh, face some competition that they were better matched up to play against. Uh, I'm telling it was it was some dark times that four game losing streak that gauntlet in the middle of the season. But uh, and you know it's funny you hear it all the time. Everybody talks about how long the college football season is, and I was thinking about that yesterday. It, like September feels like it was three years ago. I mean yeah. <laughs> that Texas A&M Auburn game, I barely remember it, and it was I think it was the first weekend of October, uh, like six weeks ago. Um, but it's a long season. A and M was the 23rd of September. That was all the way back. Oh my gosh. Feels a long time ago, but uh, it shows you it's a long season because Auburn, they've qualified for a bowl game after beating Arkansas, which I think a lot of people, including me at times did not think was going to happen in that rough four game stretch. But, you know, we'll we'll talk more about what Hugh Freeze has done in year one, but I think that's, that's a big feather in his cap just to, to make a bowl game in year one, to get through that tough stretch and to be able to keep the team focused, keep them together and, and finish strong. And I think regardless of, Probably what happens these next two games, unless you lose them both, you feel feel very strong about the end of his first season. Yeah, obviously, you know, a month ago, today is uh, November the 15th. A month ago, they were coming off a bad loss uh, down here in Baton Rouge against LSU, 48-18, to 18, a lot of question marks to uh, just overall. Like, it, it was just bad, uh, a bad, bad loss. Not in the terms of losing to LSU. There's a lot of teams that haven't been able to stop LSU uh, defensively, but I think couple things. Putting up 18 points on LSU's defense was a little disappointing for uh, Auburn fans. And then just the form and fashion, that game really never felt close. Well, they turned around, uh, lost to Ole Miss by a touchdown in a really tightly contested football game, and then reeled off wins against Mississippi State, Vandy, and Arkansas. Your thoughts on that stretch? Well, LSU, the the most disappointing part about that game was – how defeated Auburn looked early in that game. Like it was middle of the first quarter and that, that whole sideline looked defeated. I'm like, yeah. you had two weeks to prepare for probably the best offense in the country. We thought that then we still think it now. Uh, and after a quarter you're giving up, that's, that's not a good look. That's, that's trouble from top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, Ole Miss, they get back home. They use the home crowd to keep it close, but um Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin did not look like a typical Ole Miss Lane Kiffin team that game. He wasn't interested in scoring a lot of points because he knew he didn't have to. And and he's he said after that game that that was going into that game he felt like that was the first time in his career that he didn't have to put up forty points to beat somebody, uh, which <laughs> is not a vote of confidence for the <laughs> Auburn offense. And I don't know, maybe that got back to the Auburn locker room because they you know rallying off forty eight to beat Arkansas, they hang. 31 at Vanderbilt, which they felt it felt like similar to that game in the second half to Mississippi State, where they hung 27 on yeah. on the Bulldogs. But both of the the Mississippi State and Vanderbilt second halves kind of felt like they knew they were in control of the game, and, and they didn't have to keep running up points, even though I think they could. Um, but these last three games, the offenses looked so much better. They look like a different team. Um, most notably to me, offensively, they've Hugh Freeze. He stepped stepped into that those offensive meetings and, and doing a lot more input in the offense, which honestly he probably should have done from day one, but he wanted to focus on recruiting, get this roster back to where it was. Cause he said when he took the job, he was shocked at, at how poor the roster was that how yeah. thin, how, how much quality the roster was lacking. Um, and he's made really, really good inroads, putting together a really nice recruiting class. But these last three games, uh, getting back to running the football, Jarquez Hunter, he's ran for 100 yards in three straight games, which is, I mean, something we didn't see the first half of the season. Uh, and I think part of that was tough defense. He's going up against Georgia, obviously. Uh, Ole Miss up front, much better. We've talked about them on the live shows, mm-hmm. how much better they are defensively this year under Pete Golding. Um, 
but but getting back to what Auburn football is, and Hugh Freeze is a guy being in the SEC, knows what Auburn is. Uh, you know, historically at Auburn, Auburn's at its best when it's a run-first offense, uh, no matter what the style is. If it's wishbone with Pat Dye, if it's eye formation with Pat Dye, if it's more spread like we've seen even since Terry Bowden. You know, that's, that's funny to look at the, the different eras of football. I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent here really quick, but I've gone back and watched some of those games from the 90s uh, on YouTube. People have cut them up. Auburn's running a spread offense in 1994. Auburn goes down to Florida and beats number one Florida, which was a huge upset uh, for Auburn then. And I think every play was out of shotgun, and Auburn was throwing the ball. So they were they were, they were running a spread in the 90s. Um, but, you know, run first team, strong running game, leaning on the run. Um, Hugh Freeze has, has stepped into those offensive meetings and, you know, foreshadowing to the offseason, the end of the season. There's going to be a change made at offensive coordinator. I think that's pretty obvious. And I think it's obvious the changes that Freeze has made uh, the last three weeks. Hey, you talk about some of the biggest things that have helped Auburn, and really, Will, it's kind of been maybe solidifying the quarterback position a little bit. And, and you know, you, you've kind of gone back and forth early in the season. It really feels like now that you have Peyton Thorne is number one and, you know, some changes behind him. Robbie Ashford really not a part of the picture. How much has that had an impact? Not necessarily – no Robbie Ashford, but just but just really Peyton Thorne kind of maybe stepping up his level of play. Yeah, I think it's been huge. I think Thorne, it took him a while to get comfortable and, and kind of get his feet under him in the SEC, which, you know, we knew it was going to take some time. Um, but he came in, he's even still been a disappointment, I think, from what most people thought he, he could be and, and maybe would be. Um, but he's looked really good. I think the, the running game getting better has helped him a lot. Not changing the quarterbacks in and out has helped help keep momentum of drives and, and him really stepping up and being a leader and taking the QB one position, I think has, has worked wonders. Uh, you said it changes behind him. Holden Garner is number two on the depth chart right now. Yeah. Um, he's, he's practiced really well. The coaches really like him. I mean, same thing. The last coaching staff said he's got the best looking ball on the team at the quarterback position. Um, but the little bit we've seen him, he got a trick play against Ole Miss, which, I don't think it's fair to judge them all, but he did not look ready to play on that play, which is concerning because you know they were practicing that play. Um, but Ashford came in before him at the end against Arkansas, but only got one drive and Garner got two drives. So I think that shows who number two is. Um, and, you know, again, looking forward after this season, the quarterback position, it's hard to say what's going to happen. I don't, I don't see Robbie Ashford sticking around, but he already used his free transfer coming to mm -hmm. Auburn from Oregon. So it's going to be very interesting to see Auburn's got Walker White coming in. That's going to be a really loaded quarterback room. I think somebody's going to have to leave. I don't know if it's Garner or Ashford. Garner does have the free transfer. Uh, he's a guy I think that would do really, really well, a step down, maybe going to the Sun Belt, Conference USA. Um, you know, maybe not have to go as far because uh, we've seen we've seen quarterbacks drop from SEC to ACC and they have a lot of success. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be a loaded room. I think there's going to have to be uh, some subtraction there. And Hugh Freeze, he loves Walker White, the four-star quarterback out of Arkansas. I uh, think he's going to make a huge impact over the next four to five years at Auburn. Yeah, you see, so you heard it right here first. Uh, Holden Garner are going to be the quarterback at Georgia Tech next year. Um, no, look, and, and Haynes to, King is leaving? What? He getting King, drafted? Yeah, he's getting drafted. Number one <laughs> overall, dude. Top five quarterback in the country. Um, <laughs> hey, look, no, I mean, this is the stretch they needed. And I think, too, we can sit here and say – you know, we, we talked about coming off that Sanford game, Will. You know, it was going to be a tough stretch. A&M, yep. uh, you know, obviously fired Jimbo Fisher. We talked about that. But still a really, really good defense. And you saw that as well. Georgia, LSU, Ole Miss. But now it kind of feels like this Auburn team it pretty much beat the teams that you should have and lost mm -hmm. to the teams that you should have. So it, they're kind of right on track. Like, I know that's not something that fans really want to hear. But you really haven't lost a game that you're like, gosh, we really should have won that football game. Uh, at least I feel like that. Is that yeah. kind of your sentiment? Yeah, that's how I feel too. You know, the start of the year, I was thinking this team could be anywhere from five wins to nine wins. I really didn't think yeah. they could do more than that. You have some things fall your way. And you look at how it's played out. The games that I thought Auburn would have a good shot in, they did. They just couldn't get it done. Texas A&M being one of them and the other one being Ole Miss. And, you know, Alabama's always a toss-up, no matter the quality of, of team put out there. But and Auburn still got a chance to to take that one from Alabama too. But uh, yeah, this is you look at it and you, you're disappointed. You lose four games in a row. That's something Auburn doesn't ever do. Mm -hmm. um, 
historically. So you're disappointed with that, but you got to, I, I titled it in our a little rundown, 30,000 foot view, take a 30,000 foot view of where things are through, through uh, 10 games for Auburn. They're right where you thought they would be. They beat the teams they should have beat uh, and, and have lost the ones that they should have lost to. And Ole Miss at the time, we thought it'd be a much bigger uh, loss than seven points. We definitely thought Georgia would be a blowout, but Auburn really played well, held their own against Georgia and lost it right there at the end. But um, yeah, Auburn, Auburn, I think is, is, meeting expectations right where you thought they would be as far as yeah. on the field. Yeah, and I mean, you would have been very disappointed if they've lost at home to Mississippi State uh, mm -hmm. up in Nashville or on the road against Arkansas, especially with how those three team seasons have kind of played out. I mean, that's kind of the bottom barrel of the SEC. So it does yeah. uh, it does put you, to me, Auburn, I wouldn't say he's like – I'd probably say like smack dab in the middle, like in that middle rung of SEC teams, and that's kind of you know, I think what the expectation was coming into the season. <laughs> You look at different outlets on three dozen uh, weekly power rankings. Auburn's been between, I think, seven and ten every week, which I think is fair. I think they're they're kind of on that bottom half of uh, the middle of the comp the conference, um, but definitely not in the bottom half. And I think they showed that because they played three teams that, that are at the bottom this year, and and they they won every game by two scores. And I'll tell you what, last week's win against Arkansas was. I think I texted you. You and Ralph during the game, I said, who is this Auburn team? Who Who is this wearing the AU on the helmet? Because it's not yeah. the same team I've seen all year. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, that's an Arkansas team that I will say, Arkansas has had a really bad run, but it's still got talent. I mean, KJ Jefferson yes. is still a good player. Rocket Sanders still a really good player. They still have a very good defensive front. And it's just one of those things that I think Auburn was playing a lot of confidence uh, over there in uh, Fayetteville. So that's that's a big one. That's a big one for them. Mm -hmm. Auburn's run off three straight. Uh, like you mentioned, they're going to play New Mexico State this weekend. We'll take a brief look at that later in the show. And then obviously the Iron Bowl, which is you mentioned earlier. It's a game no matter the records, especially you played inside Jordan Hare. And I told you, uh, talking with some Alabama reporters when LSU played up there a couple weeks ago, they said, yeah, that's that's not a given. Like they, the, the folks that have been around the Alabama beat long enough know that anytime they have to go down to Auburn, it's not a given no matter what Auburn's record are. But Hey, you look at this, and the good news is is that you mentioned it. Hugh Freeze wanted to really focus in on recruiting early part of the season, and it looks like some of that's starting to pay off as high school seasons are starting to come to a close. I know in the state of Georgia, playoffs start. Louisiana down here, playoffs have started. So uh, Alabama has, has is in the second round, I believe, uh, of their state playoffs. So as high school seasons wind down, we're a little over a month away from early signing day. Well, the latest on the Auburn recruiting fund is pretty positive, and I'll just kick it off here. Jamonte Waller flipping from Florida. Florida's a bleeding program. We're going to talk about that on the live show on Wednesday night, it feels like. But that recruiting class is hurting pretty bad, a couple flips mm -hmm. elsewhere. Uh, Auburn's a team that can benefit from this. And I don't know. It feels like Hugh Freeze put in the work early and now maybe starting to pay some dividends as we get closer to early signing day. Yeah, he really did. Um and it's funny. I think uh, I think you got into somebody uh, into it with somebody about this. I don't remember where, but uh, somebody was saying relationships don't matter anymore. Don't matter anymore. It's just all about the money. Could not be any more false. You still have to establish these relationships with these high school kids, these high school players, and then uh, trust them. Get them to trust that the money will come as far as NIL goes. But you said Jamonte Waller going to play Jack linebacker for Auburn, where Auburn needs a lot of help. I think he'll come in and play as a freshman. He is he's only a four star, but man, he's he's a high four star. He's he's fringe five star. Really, really good player. Uh will be a difference maker for Auburn. Uh he I think he and Keldrick Falk, especially if they play on opposite ends, it's gonna be, make a scary pass rush for Auburn in the next couple of years. Um the only other guy from Florida we've watched is LJ McCray, currently committed to Florida. Um Auburn, Auburn's recruited him hard. Um you know, they just flipped Jamonte Waller. They've got the momentum there. Waller, I'm sure he's talked with McCray <clears throat> and working to working to get on him to join at Auburn. Uh, and mm -hmm. McCray, a five star, would be a huge, huge push for this uh, recruiting class for Auburn. Uh, sitting outside the top 10 right now, but with a, a really good chance, I think, to make the top 10, especially if, if they get some flips. Uh, but the big one to watch is, is what happens with Texas A&M in their class. Auburn yeah. feels really good about Cam Coleman. They're not out yet on Cam Coleman, the, the Central Phoenix City wide receiver, five-star receiver. He's really, really good, but he's and he's going to be really, really tough to get. Um, you worry about Florida State with him. Florida State 
like Auburn, seems to have a war chest. Auburn got a huge NIL donation this week, over a million dollars. So Auburn, That's huge. Auburn donors really pushing hard, really uh, supporting Hugh Freeze, something that I don't think Auburn's done, their donors have done in three to four years. They, they got tired of Gus Malzahn, and they zipped up their pocketbooks. They didn't like Brian Harson from day one, so they never opened him up for him. Uh, but they like Hugh Freeze. They believe in him. They're going to open up, and that's a, that's a huge deal. What makes programs elite is the amount of money and the amount of support uh, that the coaches get. Um, <clears throat> another name from Texas A&M, Cohen Eccles, the offensive lineman. Uh, I mean, same – different year, same story for Auburn. Auburn needs offensive linemen. Yes. Auburn has struggled <laughs> to recruit offensive linemen. Freeze has done a really good job already getting uh, commitment from DeAndre Carter. Uh, feels really good about another offensive lineman, favor Edwin. Uh, both those guys, four stars. Um, Auburn, the heavy favorite for, for favor Edwin. <clears throat> but, you know, obviously being from the state of Alabama, you got to worry about Alabama and that one. Clemson really in on favor Edwin too. But I think that three-game stretch, Auburn really showed and Hugh Freeze really showed taking more of a, a handle of the offense, showing what the offense is going to look like moving forward. <clears throat> uh and really showing these recruits something, giving them something on film to look at to to uh, to kind of see where they could see themselves in that offense. <clears throat> and then, you know, coming back off that four-game losing streak, being able to rebound like that, uh, it works wonders. And, and then, you know, especially if he gets them on campus for the Iron Bowl, they're, they're going to get the full package that yeah. game. That's – Jordan Hare is going to be rocking for that one. Um, one more name I would watch out for is K.J. Bolden, committed to Florida State, the five-star safety. He he's a guy that I think has been made pretty clear. He's going to the highest bidder. I don't think that will ever be official, but I think that's kind of the, the worst kept secret. Uh, he's going to the highest bidder. Uh, Auburn was really close. Auburn really pushed hard for him because in the summer, Auburn wasn't even on his radar. They weren't in his top 10. And then when he committed, when did he commit? September or the end of August, I think? It was around the start of the season, so mm -hmm. in between that kind of Labor Day uh, routine. But it was I think it was in, it started after his high school year he, he announced mm -hmm. his commitment. I think I think that's right. He committed to Florida State, and, and Auburn went from outside of his top ten to being in his top three that he put out a couple days before that. Um, so Auburn's still not out on K.J. Bolden, I don't think. Florida State's going to be tough to get that flip from. I think it'll also be hard for Auburn, if he flips, to keep him from flipping to Georgia. He is uh, – he is a Georgia boy. So, yeah. But again, if Auburn gets him, I mean, you're looking at a top 10, possibly top five class, first recruiting class for Hugh Freeze, something Auburn hasn't been able to say in a while and, and really give Auburn momentum going into bowl practice uh, this year. Cause like I said, Auburn made a bowl game year one. Yeah. You mentioned that KJ Bolden. Uh, that'd be huge. I mean, absolutely huge. Just a freak athlete up there at Buford High School or Buford U, as the folks call it, uh, around that area. It's <laughs> just nuts. Hey, you translated or you transitioned us, I should say, pretty well in, into the um, into the next topic of conversation because recruiting's going well. And I, I've said this about Georgia Tech, like, and I'm going to preview it on Thursday night. I think that getting to a bowl game for what programs where Georgia Tech and Auburn are getting those extra 16 to 17 practices are massive getting the extra eyes on you when a kid can say, okay, they're playing in the postseason, playing meaningful football in December and potentially January. It's massive for programs, especially wanting to build up. So we take a look at this and we kind of mentioned this earlier, but revisiting some of those expectations, they've pretty much beaten, like we said, who you thought they should be. They've lost the teams that you kind of maybe expected them to lose to. But when you go back and kind of look at your preseason predictions and now knowing that they're going to go to a bowl game, regardless of what happens over the next two games, where how how pleased when you kind of take the uh, we'll say the uh, the navy and orange goggles off and you look at this season? Yeah, well, like I said earlier, I figured Auburn. <clears throat> I really felt comfortable Auburn would get to six wins and, and yeah. possibly up to eight, with with an outside chance at nine because you, you Auburn getting the Iron Bowl, getting Alabama at home, you can't count that game out unless unless Auburn just comes in you know, already dead and beaten. Yeah. That's that's the only way. And, and that's rare, and that's not the case this year, especially the way the schedule worked out, I think, was perfect for Auburn. They're, they're going to go in on a high, especially if they can handle business against New Mexico State, which I've I've told you all week, they're, they are no slouch. Yeah. They're going to the Conference USA Championship game. They've got eight wins. They're somehow eight and three. I don't know how that works. They're, they're so good that they have played more regular season games than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, yeah. you're right. I <laughs> don't know how that works, but – uh. They're no slouch for sure. So Auburn mm -hmm. got to be focused. Um, 
But, you know, I think trying not to be a homer, and I don't like to say this because I am such an Auburn fan, but Freeze, Freeze is in a very precarious position at this at this point in the year, and, and, and his future at Auburn kind of rides on this. A lot of comparisons are made between him and Gus Malzahn. They're very similar personality-wise. Their offensive styles are similar. Their career paths are similar. They both were at Arkansas State before getting big SEC jobs. If you remember 2013 – Gus Malzahn's first year, he runs the table, takes a three and nine team, runs the table, beats Alabama, wins the SEC, plays in the national championship game. Now, Freeze won't reach those heights, but he still might beat Alabama. Malzahn came in, taking over the worst team in Auburn football history and made him a national title contender, beat Alabama, obviously beat Alabama as, as an offensive coordinator with Cam Newton in 2010. That just raised the bar even higher. Auburn fans expected to be competing for a national title every year and beating Alabama every year. That obviously didn't happen, and that ultimately, I think, led to the demise of Malzahn at Auburn because he couldn't reach those expectations again. Now, if Freeze comes in, say he goes 8-4, and four, beats Alabama, oh, fans, casual fans, are going to sit there and think, oh, well, we should beat Alabama every year. Hugh Freeze is a better coach than Malzahn. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's oh, that. I, I do not want to be in his shoes if he beats Alabama. It'll be great for a week. But that's about yeah. as, as as long as the good times will last because that would be the expectation every time he meets with a booster. Say, you got to beat Alabama, got to beat Alabama, which is what they say every time. But that'll be the expectation, and, and that just makes this hardest job in the country, I think, even harder. Uh, and try not to be biased when I say that either. But yeah, no, it's it's I, hard to argue a, a harder job. I, I think you're right, and and I'll even add this on to which is kind of a similar situation, like what's happening down here. Like Brian Kelly was probably a victim of his own success in year one. Mm -hmm. A team went nine and three, made the SEC title, beat Alabama. They don't do it this year. And everyone's like, whoa. I mean, like the casual fans are like, whoa, Brian Kelly can't win the big games. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He did it last year. He did. He did last year. (laughs) So it's just, I think it's a really interesting predicament with, I mean, Brian Kelly's a really, really good football head head football coach. I think, you know, I, I mentioned when, I mentioned this when Hugh Freeze got hired. Like I thought this was is going to be an interesting uh, HR type of deal, like a PR hire because you got to handle a lot of different things, not yep. because of him, but just from outside so outside forces. But this is a good football hire. Like I felt like it was a very very good football hire. And so now, yeah, if they go eight and four, I mean, Will, can can you imagine if they go eight and four and then? I mean that puts them in a nice, nice little bowl game potentially against the team that we don't name on our live show, but that you know you guys like. Oh, well, if, I would. Ooh, don't. Yeah. I don't, I don't don't do that to me because I think Auburn would just get. I said it on Monday show and got some heat for it. Auburn would get swallowed up by by that team that can't be named. That's yeah. I, I, that would not be fun. I would not. Yeah. Imagine. <laughs> if if you're a first time listener and you have no idea what we're talking about, we're talking about the uh, the Ferenwitz team. Uh, that's the one we're talking about. So, no, look, I mean, you get to a decent bowl game and right around New Year's, and then you get to nine wins, like nine and four in year one at Auburn. Well, it just sets it so high. It sets the bar so high because then mm-hmm. if you don't beat out, or can, if you don't reach nine wins again, it seems a disappointment. Yeah, and and it's it's crazy to think about how unlikely and how great of a job that is that freeze has done in year one, because, you know, I said the 2012 Auburn team was the worst one ever. That was record wise. There was still talent on that football team. A lot of talent that Malzahn had recruited, especially on the offensive side that set him up to be able to take that team. He just needed a couple pieces quarterback, obviously being the biggest one, but to, to add a couple pieces to that team and, and take him to the championship, this team that freeze got had nothing, all the talent left before he was yeah. hired. So he he kind of had to build this thing from the ground up and and has done a really, really, really good job. Um, obviously, still got two da- two games to go. My, my tune can change quickly if, if the final two games don't go the way we want them to. Um, but, I mean, like you said, from a football standpoint, this was a really good hire, a really good fit uh, for, for him in Auburn. He's He's got a daughter that, that goes to Auburn. Uh, so just – Culture fit was perfect. Football fit was really good. You said the PR stuff. I'm telling you, if he wins these two games, that PR stuff, nobody will, nobody will even remember that it happened yeah. if he beats Alabama in year one. So, uh, like I said, it's this is a, a, a it's it's a predicament for him. It's a predicament yeah. because obviously you're going to try to win the game. You want to win the game, but it's going to make his longevity that much tougher. 
It is, and I think that's the pressure that comes at coaching at a place like Auburn. Uh, specifically, I mean, you're playing Georgia and Alabama every year. You happen to beat one of those teams or maybe both of those teams in a single season. It sets a precedent that not a lot of – and I don't – well, you know Auburn history more than I do. Not a lot of Auburn head coaches have done that consistently, beat Auburn and Georgia – or beat Alabama and Georgia yep. – time and time after again and so it sets a dangerous precedent like you said where you know people grow i think sometimes fans and look they're fanatics and i get this they lose sight of just how hard that is especially yeah. with where those two programs are well i mean tommy Tuberville beat alabama six times in a row how many times he beat georgia in that stretch i None. think twice twice i don't I remember he beat yeah. georgia twice during that stretch so that's it's tough. I mean, it's hard. And I, we've said it on live shows and it's hard every year, no matter who, what year it is, who you're playing, what's going on in college football, you get 12 different versions of every team. And it's yeah. just a matter of, of which one you get that week. And it's hard. The elite teams, the consistent teams like Georgia and Alabama, they're going to be tough to beat every week. And, and and sometimes you'll have, that's why upsets happen because you'll have a, a, an, an incredible performance by a lesser team. Uh, stepping up and, and being able to knock down a big team. So, hey, I mean, look, Auburn goes into this weekend, needs to take care of business, owning that 4 o'clock Eastern slot on SEC Network against New Mexico I, State. Just change it to the Auburn Network, I guess, because that's like the only time Auburn can play. Just Yeah, just just uh, have an asterisk <laughs> that says this is Auburn's time slot. Like when they go over to full-time ESPN <laughs> ABC next year, they're taking the 4 p.m. SEC Network slot. They'll take it. Um, and then they obviously we'll talk about – We'll take a look at the preview game for the Alabama game, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. I mean, both of these teams should win this weekend. Auburn should beat New Mexico State. Alabama should beat the Mocs of Chattanooga. Uh, I should wish we'd switch these opponents because I would feel yeah. much better about Auburn playing Chattanooga. Than yeah, <laughs> you, you feel much better about having at least seven wins on the docket and rolling mm -hmm. uh, back home. But you know, we'll see. It's going to be a lot of fun. But no, Auburn, kind of that thirty thousand foot view. I think we both can agree that they're trending in the right direction. Uh, this is a program that. I don't know if Auburn fan, every single Auburn fan realized it, but the talent level, and you mentioned it, it I don't want to say it was non-existent because that sounds like it's a shot at the players, but there was no depth. And I remember being back in Nashville in the summer, and 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 Freeze was very open and upfront about that. Like, this roster is not constructed to play with the Alabamas, the Georgias, the LSUs of the world consistently week in and week out, and that's pretty much what you do in the SEC and succeed at a high level. And so it's going to take some time. But, man, if they can – even 7-5, and five, Will, and then winning a bowl game 8-5, and five, that, that's got to be a nice success. Uh, and I think really – really all realistically you could ask for. I, I'm an outsider looking at it. That's that's what I would have asked for and been like, you know, I, that's a good season. I feel the same way. If anybody complains about going 8-5, and five, winning a bowl game, I think you need to check your expectations because yeah, this was a team that that – honestly was looking at five and seven, six and six again. And I think Hugh Freeze has done a really good job of, of lifting up what was there, adding some pieces, Peyton Thorne, obviously an upgraded quarterback. Um, but, but lifting up um, the talent that was already on the roster and, and getting them motivated. I mean, like he said, this is not a roster to built to play with Georgia's and Alabama's what they lose to Georgia by seven. Or yeah. at home or four? Was yeah. it I think was it I think it was four. Twenty seven. They lost uh twenty seven twenty. Twenty seven. So a touchdown. 20. A touchdown. Yeah, lost, and if not for Brock Bowers, seven. they probably win the football game. Yeah. You lose to Ole Miss by seven. I mean, yeah. I it's kind of a garbage time touchdown you get early in the fourth quarter, but scoreboard numbers don't lie. That's what I always say. Numbers don't lie, but they don't always tell the truth. That twenty eight twenty one score doesn't tell the whole truth, but you still only lost by seven. You put yourself in a position to, to keep it close. Yeah, and I think, too, something, you know, we've seen programs so often, uh, we've seen it at Auburn, we've seen it at other places, where you undergo a four-game losing streak like they did and things implode. And I think it says a lot about the culture that has been established, the foundation mm -hmm. that has been established under Hugh Freeze in such a short amount of time that, you know, after that Ole Miss game, it would have been really easy for them to say, you know, guys say, hey, maybe I'm going to leave or maybe I want to focus on NFL aspirations or maybe I want to try to explore or the portal or whatever. A freshman just, says, I want to I want a red shirt. Yeah, a freshman says, like MJ Moore said at NC State. Like, that would be nuts. Like All Keldrick that to say. Falk, Keldrick yeah. Falk, who's made a huge impact on that defense line, could just say, like, nah, I'm going to red shirt. I yeah. think he was already past the four games at that point. But, you know, a guy like him that's actually contributing could have just been like, nah, I think I'm going to red shirt. But yeah, I, I agree Freeze, 
I mean, it's a complete 180 from where it was when he took over. He's he's done a really, really nice job laying the foundation. Yeah, I think Auburn has to be happy about what the, what's going on. And, you know, obviously we'll revisit this if they lose this weekend. Then everything we just said is thrown out the window. Yeah. But that's the beauty of college football. We'll have to talk about it. But, hey, appreciate you so much for tuning in, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's after the fact on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or you're watching this. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're going to be live of uh, through the rest of the season, I think, and I say that with literally this week and next week, we'll have to revisit that for the Thanksgiving schedule as everyone goes their kind of separate ways. Uh, we're going to find a show schedule and get that out there for the postseason because you know as well as I do, and it's going to be, it's about to just get nuts. I mean, we've already had yep. three, four, almost four coach firings that could affect Auburn and other SEC teams. It's going to be nuts to kind of follow and, and watch the portal conversation, bowl conversation. I'm excited to do our best bets for bowl mania. That's going to be uh, <laughs> something Dr. Bob is going to really have to keep up with because I don't know what that's going to look like. So, hey, but we'll have to, uh, we'll have to do that. Auburn, trending in the right direction. I think we can say that. But for Bryce Coon, for Will Manis, my name's Bryce Coon. We'll catch you next time here on the Crowded Booth Podcast. Pile in here and make yourself feel at home. The Crowded Booth is coming on. The Crowded Booth with Bryce Coon.